always you again. Tonight, tonight's story, and for the next few nights, is from an anthology called Hairs in the Palm of the Hand by Jan Mark. It is quite an old anthology now. 1981. So, um, sorry for the lumbering noise, by the way. This is the dog. Hello, dog. Yes, there you go. Um, yes. Hairs in the palm of the hand. And this story is called Chutzpah, which means bloody nerve, I think. And, yeah. Some of the references are a little dated. I'll point those out as we go along. Eileen had never been into the school before, but she knew the playing field very well since she spent most of the Easter holidays lurking in the bushes that grew all around the edge of it. The main gate was in Cold Harbour Lane, but Eileen had her own entrance at the opposite end of the field, where the builder's yard was separated from it by nothing more than a bit of stringy fencing, reinforced with barbed wire. Eileen guessed that she was not the only one to use this route, for the stark barbed wire blossomed like the Glastonbury thorn, with multicoloured fragments of wool and serge and denim, where other furtive persons had gone in and out in a hurry. Auntie Audrey's house was on the corner, next to the builder's yard, so it was the work of ten seconds for Eileen to climb over the garden wall, nip across the yard between the timber stacks, and through the wire. On the first day of term, she put on the red and blue bomber jacket over her brown jeans and the t-shirt with West Ham for President written across the chest. Then she went over the wall. It was a pale morning, cloud-coloured, and, sh- and a shifting haze veiled the school buildings. A haze in which bells rang and whistles blew. That, along with the distant shouts and muffled drumming of unseen feet, put Eileen in mind of a mass breakout from a prisoner of war camp, and the looming looming hulk of the building began to assume the outlines of Colditz Castle. At any moment she might be flattened by the bruising beam of a searchlight, or brought down in the jaws of a Doberman. A dog did in fact go past on cue, but it was a bandy slothful retriever, and she knew that it belonged to the caretaker, being both confirmed lurkers they had met before in the bushes and after a brief sniff at her tennis shoes, it disappeared into the mist again, nose to the ground. Molehound, said Eileen. Somewhere close by, a cement mixer stuttered into life. Machine gun, she said, stooping under a hail of bullets. Eileen had, in the course of her holiday reconnaissance, located the entrance to the junior cloakrooms, but having to avoid the machine gun fire and watch out for Dobermans, She found it deserted by the time she arrived, and took time off to wash her hands just to see what the soap was like. The cloakroom smelled reassuringly like the cloakroom at her other school of feet and disinfectant and wet paper towels. Even the soap was exactly the same, left over from last term, and as dry as old cheese, it was veined with black deposits. Already there was a moat around the wash basins and the tracks of deep footprints led across the concrete floor and out into the corridor. They went that away, said Eileen, eyeing the footprints and prepared to sleuth after them, but at that moment a bell rang. Doors slammed, footsteps broke out, punctuated by high-pitched yells and counter-yells from gruff teachers lower down the scale. Eileen retired to a lavatory, locked herself in, and standing on the seat, peered over the top of the door until she was sure it was safe to come out, watching a stream of people flood the corridor. While she was peering, a small figure trickled into the cloakroom and concealed itself behind a partition. Eileen waited until silence fell again, and then said, I can see you. The figure jumped guiltily and looked around. I'm up here, said Eileen, waving companionably over the top of the door. I'd invite you in. Only there's not really room for more than one, she sang. But you'd look sweet upon the seat of a lavatory made for two. The guilty loiterer looked more shaken still, then horrified, then burst into tears. Now, don't do that, Eileen said, remorsefully. What's the matter, then? Somebody thump you? 
She climbed down and bolted the door and went over to the weeping figure in the corner. It was wearing the shiny striped tie, white blouse and the blue plated skirt of a very new school uniform. I should sit down, said Eileen, clearing a glade among the coats. Those are slick shoes, she said, looking away from her own tennis shoes, which had long ago turned the colour of old mushrooms. Very nice. Are you new? The girl nodded and wiped her nose on the bright white sleeve. So am I. I didn't know you had to wear school uniform. We don't, but they like you to. Weren't you told? said the girl, looking at West Ham for president. No, I only came here a couple of weeks ago. Never been in here before. What's your name? Lisa Donovan. We moved house, and I had to change schools. I could have stayed, but my mum said it wasn't worth it, not all that way on the bus. I was at the Montgomery before. Never heard of it. Was it all right? It was better than this dump, said Lisa, reviving slightly. There was only five hundred of us. Sir said there was fourteen hundred here. I bet half the teachers never know who we are. I bet they don't, said Eileen, thoughtfully. You going to hide in here all day? I got lost, said Lisa. They've got two buildings here, and I went to the wrong one. I got this far and stopped. I never even found my class. Nor did I, said Eileen. Mind you, I wasn't looking. Let's have a look around while they're all in assembly. We can find our own way. They wandered into the corridor. Lisa, regaining confidence, began to get chatty. How do you know they're in? How do you know they're in assembly? Look at that funny painting. Do you think they'll let you wear trousers here? They don't down the Montgomery. I don't care if they don't. I shan't stay if I don't like it," said Arlene, dusting the seat of her jeans. "Don't be daft." "I shan't." "Straight up," said Arlene. "Look, all these rooms are for art and craft, and that we only got two at my other school. I'll get into ever such a row if I don't find my class." Lisa fretted. "They'll think I'm absent, and they won't get any dinner." "That mightn't be a bad thing," Arlene said darkly. How do you know what it'll be like? Rat burgers, cold greasy chips, gold stones in custard. Hey, there's a sort of oven in that room. Do you think it's a kiln? Do you think they do pottery? I'll stop if I can do pottery. I want to make a thatched cottage for my nan. A cottage? Yeah, well, a teapot really," said Eileen vaguely. Done like a thatched cottage with flowers on that, and the thatch bit comes off, and that's the lid, and the chimney's the spout. I saw one in a shop once. Don't you care if you're late? Not really. I can't remember how the handle went, though," said Eileen. Lisa already had little lines between her eyebrows. A born warrior, Eileen decided. What class are you in? I'm in two A. Don't know," said Eileen. "Eh,、hey, what's that funny box on the wall? Looks like a loudspeaker." It was a loudspeaker. It spoke. Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome back to Shepway School. There will be no assembly this morning. They aren't in assembly," said Lisa. "Someone will see us, as the pot builders are working in the hall. There will be no pottery classes this term, as Mrs. Abbott is on maternity leave. Not staying then," said Eileen. "The decoration of the lower school arch room has taken rather longer than we hoped, so all classes who normally go to that room are to line up quietly in the east corridor and wait for someone to collect them." The mobile classroom has arrived, so there will be no more lessons in the medical room. Repeat, not in the medical room. All those who used to go to the medical room will now have their lessons in the new mobile. That's all. Have a good term," said the loudspeaker heartily, and suspended transmission before anyone had a chance to answer it back. "Who's that now?" says Eileen. "You're right. This is a dump." "That's the headmaster," said Lisa. "I rec- recognise his voice. He's got funny teeth." That's not all. It's got funny, if you ask me," said Eileen. "Look, all these rooms is for craft. The classrooms are over the other side of the playground, in that bit that looks like a milk crate. See all them heads?" Lisa looked through the window, and that must be the new mobile. What that caravan thing with no wheels? I thought a mobile was something you hung up that twiddled round. Some people don't know they're born," said Eileen. "Second year already, never been in a mobile." This insult went straight over Lisa's head. Oh look! They're all coming out. What shall we do? I'll never find my class. Don't start bawling again," said Dalian. "We'll ask someone. They can't all have funny teeth." However, before they found someone, someone found them. It was a bearded teacher in a maroon tracksuit with a whistle hung around his neck. "Lost," he said. "I'm not surprised. I wish someone would show me the way out." "Where are you supposed to be?" "We don't know," said Dalian. "That's why we're lost." Are you new? Yes," said Eileen. 
then I might suggest that you're not getting off to a very good start, and you'll wear a skirt in future, please. Girls aren't allowed to wear trousers to school until they're in the fifth year. Can the fifth year boys wear skirts, then? Eileen asked. The teacher appeared not to hear this. What class are you in? 2A, said Lisa. Room 9, first left. And you? 2B, said Eileen, a little too promptly. There is no 2B, said the teacher, sharply. You must mean 2V. You've got all them classes in one year, said Eileen. Only eight, he said. But they aren't numbered in any way that you'd understand. Two V's for the thickies, then, said Eileen. That's me. It's in the bottom corner, last room, said the teacher. And you'd better hurry up, or you'll find they've all gone somewhere else. And what's your name, young lady? He said to Eileen. Julie Smith, said Eileen. I shall remember you, Julie. Now hurry along. They hurried, but Lisa hurried faster. Come on, Julie, you heard what he said. My name's not Julie, said Eileen. But you told... That was just temporary. What if he finds out? I bet I never see him again, said Eileen. Anyway, you'll forget. You could see he was a games teacher. That's all only ever remembers the boys. What is your name, then? Lisa was beginning to look as if she thought there might be safer ways of beginning the day than in Eileen's company. Barbara. You can call me Barbie, like the dolls. You don't look like one, Lisa said. Who want to look like a Barbie doll, said Eileen. Except my sister. She doesn't have any choice. Here's your room, 2A. It's empty. Another teacher looked out of a stockroom. What are you two doing? We're new, said Ali. We lost our class. All second years have art and crafts on Tuesday mornings, but you'll be split up into groups. You'd better run along and see who can fit you in. Split up, fit it in, anyone would think we was luggage. Ali muttered. Please, miss. Lisa Curry cut in hurriedly. My teacher doesn't know I'm here. I won't be on the dinner register. Then go down to the office and sort it out. Where's the office? said Eileen. We're new. Down the steps, through the entrance hall, first right, and hurry. Don't hurry, Eileen cautioned as soon as they were out of shot. earshot. You'll only get in the flap again. Here we are. I'll wait. What about you? I'll go home for lunch, said Eileen. Probably. Lisa sorted out her problems with the school secretary, and emerged looking much happier. She's ever so nice, that secretary lady. Lisa said she told me not to get upset, and she found the 2A register and marked me present. You ought to get her to find yours. I don't know what class I'm in yet, do I? That teacher said 2V. He said he thought 2V. I want to have a look at the verse, said Eileen. See all them cl cups in that glass case? Fancy leaving them out here. Back at my other school, someone would nick them. I should think you were glad to leave that school, Lisa said frankly. Come on, Barbie, we'd better get over to the dark place and find our class. Cool it, said Eileen, but she peeled herself away from the wall and followed Lisa, back the way they'd come earlier, to the corridor where they'd taken their first look round. Before they reached it, they could hear sounds of strife and complaint, and when they turned the corner, they ran into a fractious crowd of about thirty people shoving up against a locked door. Here, said one girl, the art room is full of men. What do you mean, full, said the other. I could only see two, and that's Sudesh's brother. He only left school last year. You can't count him. I don't call that full. This must be that room we got to line up quietly outside of, said Eileen. Lisa shrank back against the wall, unwilling to be sucked into the vortex, as one huge fellow, head and shoulders higher than the rest, flung himself at the door and began hammering on it. Where's Miss? We want Miss! We want Miss! We want... Shut up, Hawkins! said the first girl. Mrs. Abbott's having a baby. What, in there? said Eileen. Sir said she was on maternity leave, said Hawkins, pausing in mid-howl. That means having a baby, Dumbo, said the girl, who had identified Sudesh's short brother. Who are you anyway, said her sidekick, squaring up to, to Eileen. Who asked you to butt in? Who do you think you are? Princess Anne, said Eileen. And the band played? Believe it if you like. Who are you? I'm Helen Shoveler, that's who, and she's Sharon Atwell. Evidently this meant something, for the rest of the group drew back respectfully. So what are you going to do about it? Perhaps this isn't our group, Lisa said, hopefully. It doesn't look like our group. West Ham's rubbish, said Hawkins, catching sight of Eileen's slogan. It looks like my group, said Eileen. A belt up, you lot. Here comes the old Bill. You what? said Sharon. That's Mr. Ager. Who are you, anyway? All teachers are old Bill round our way, said Eileen. 
and down the corridor came old Bill Ager, swinging a T-square. Any more of that row, he said with a swipe that made the T-square sing like a saw, and you'll all go and wait outside. Stop trying to climb up the door, Hawkins, you'll never make it. Now what seems to be the trouble? There's all these men in the art room, said Sharon. We're locked out. The art room's being decorated, as you can very well see, said Mr. Ager, and not ten minutes ago the headmaster told you so. He also told you to wait quietly until you, be, till you were collected. But we haven't been collected, sir. <sighs> Thank you, Helen. I can see that, and I should think that the rest of the school had guessed. Something's gone horribly wrong, he said, as usual. Are you all one class? Not likely, said Sharon. We're 2H, then boys is 2V. I'm 2A, said Lisa, but no one heard. Then you better queue up outside my room in silence until I find somewhere to put you now. The mob unraveled itself until it was strung out in a lumpy line along the corridor. Eileen and Lisa found themselves at the head of it by the open door of Mr. Egger's room. Eileen looked in.